Uh, welcome to the U.S. Latinx archival methodology. Uh, we are very grateful to Carla Barger for the invitation to participate in the at the University of Illinois uh, uh, digital conference on getting started with digital humanities. It is an it is an honor honor for us to be part of this uh, important endeavor by the University of uh, of Illinois in Chicago. Um, today, the USLDH uh, team will be presenting together. And so my name is Gabriela Baez Aventura. Um, I usually go by Gabi. Um, my colleague, Carolina Villarroel, who with me are co-founders of the Center or the Space for US Latino Digital Humanities at the University of Houston. Um, our new, brand new uh, postdoc, Linda Garcia Merchant, and uh, our former postdoc who is now uh, a fourth member of our USLDH team, uh, Lorena Gothero. Uh, the agenda for today looks as, as follows. Um, so uh, Carolina will be talking about the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program. I will speak about the Digital Humanities uh, Program, USLDH. Uh, Linda will talk about public humanities and the Latinx practices. And then Lorena will talk about uh, Omeka and Timeline JS samples. So uh, I'll, I'll then I'll talk a little bit about um, the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program because this is the base for all the work that we've been doing with the uh, U.S. Latinx uh, Digital Humanities. And uh, this is uh, the Recovery Project. It's an international program that was funded almost 30 years ago by a group of scholars to, uh, who recognize the need of creating a, an alternative archive that will recover, preserve, and make available all the written legacy of Latinas and Latinos in the U.S. Uh, from uh, the colonial times until 1980, something that had not been preserved uh, at the archives, the, the traditional archives. Uh, particularly because uh, they, uh, they were produced mainly in Spanish, uh, and, uh, but also uh, because it, it belongs to a minority within the United States. Uh, the recovery program has uh, compiled an extensive bibliography of materials, pamphlets, we recover everything and anything that was published by Latinas and Latinos. That means literature, uh, history, um, cookbooks, et cetera, et cetera. We have thousands of books in our uh, repository, archivals, archival items, ephemera. We have an extensive microfilm collection uh, and newspaper collection, uh, hundreds of thousands of microfilm and digitized items, photographs. So one of the components and how the program started doing the research, and this is something that I would like to mention also, we work with the research assistants. These are uh, graduate students from uh, different departments at the University of Houston, especially from the Hispanic Studies Department. But we also welcome students from the history departments uh, uh, and um, women's studies, et cetera, et cetera. We work with, uh, under, also with undergraduate students. And, uh, and during the, the summer, we work with uh, uh, high school students, introducing them about the history of Latinas and Latinos in the United States and giving them the opportunity to uh, participate in programs and uh, uh, projects and uh, uh, creating knowledge around this material. So one of the big tasks of the program at the beginning was creating a, a record of all the materials that were produced by Latinas and Latinos in the United States. And we did that, uh, going back and visiting city by city, state by state, trying to locate everything that we can find, that we could find was produced by Latinas and Latinos. And that means everything that was written in Spanish, but not necessarily Latinos and Latinos were also published in other languages, like French, Ladino, uh, et cetera, and English, of course. We compile a bibliography of more than 20,000 records and that keeps growing uh, all the time. Uh, this uh, big bibliography includes everything that I mentioned before, books about um, art, um, about education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the big collections that we have of the program are our collection of newspapers. Uh, Latinos and Latinas uh, 
produce a lot of knowledge and culture and literature through newspapers. It was a way to communicate in the community uh, because it was very difficult to publish books. So this is one of the, the, the main uh, places where uh, uh, the community could uh, not only communicate uh, politically, uh, culturally, but also to connect with different intellectuals throughout the United States and abroad. So we have a collection at home of more than 1400 newspapers in microfilm, uh, digital format, and some of them in actual paper, which is very difficult to find because uh, uh, the paper used for newspapers, uh, it was uh, very acidic. Uh, it is very acidic. So these newspapers are disappearing, disappearing really fast. So we are in a race against time to try to locate and preserve everything that is out there in terms of newspapers. We um, sometimes, when we're lucky, we are able to incorporate a whole run of, of a newspaper, but mostly we have some issues in some cases, and sometimes we're just able, we were just able to recover a piece of a newspaper, uh, which is really sad. So. Uh, considering that the first newspaper published in Spanish in the United States was uh, El Mississippi, published in New Orleans in 1808, we, uh, we know there is a, a lot more out there that needs to be recovered. And these newspapers uh, touch every aspect of the life of the Latinas and Latinos in the U.S. So we have newspapers, political newspapers, for example, um, the newspapers from the Mexican Revolution that touch on both sides of the revolution. We have newspapers published by women. La Voz de la Mujer is, is in the slide, and uh, Feminismo Internacional, published at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and uh, we have a big collection of anarchist newspapers, more than 100 anarchist newspapers. And just to, just to show you the kind of uh, materials that we've been recovering in this sense. We also recover collections. Uh, we uh, received uh, collections throughout uh, our uh, board members, we have a, a list of board members of more than 40 uh, scholars all over the country and abroad. And, and, <clears throat> and when I say abroad, it's, it's important to mention too that we have partnerships with different countries to be able to recover these materials. For example, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, uh, and other countries, because some of these materials travel. It's um, some of the exiles coming into the United States, or uh, independence movements that were forged in the United States, they produce materials here, the intellectuals produce materials here, and then they go back to their countries and sometimes they take the materials with them or they left the materials here in the United States. So we try to complete the history of both countries, giving back to those countries the materials that are stayed here or uh, and exchanging information with them. So. In terms of collections, uh, well, we, we have scholars, uh, recovery scholars, we call them, that uh, you know, do research in archives, uh, on, on family archives, and, uh, and um, historical associations, and they uh, bring materials back to us so we could preserve it and make it available to, to, to everybody, you know, to use it. So one of the collections that uh, we think that uh, really represent the work that we do that is kind of this uh, detective uh, work that we do here at the, the program is the Leonor Villegas de Magnon collection. Leonor Villegas de Magnon was a, a Mexican woman living in Laredo, Texas, who uh, by the time of the Mexican Revolution decided to create a group of nurses. Uh, so she put together a group of, with of uh, Anglo women, uh, Mexican American women, and Mexican women to fight on the revolution on the side of Carranza. So we're talking about a, a, a transnational figure and um, that was very active during the Mexican revolution. And uh, in, in, at the end of the Re Mexican revolution, she decided to write her memoirs because the accounts of the Mexican Re revolution didn't, uh, didn't include uh, women. And uh, aside from the generic Adelitas and Soldaderas, um, this is a really interesting and, and, and important fact that uh, this woman, Leonor, was able to write her memoirs and realize the importance of, of uh, her importance in history and, and the importance of recording her history and other women's history during this uh, historical moment. She hired a photographer, 
She wrote her memoir in Spanish. Nobody wanted to publish it in Mexico. She rewrote the memoirs in English and uh, nobody wanted to publish it in the United States either because is it again, the account of a woman writing about a historical moment, right? So by the time uh, our times, uh, one of our board members was able to trace through the newspapers these memoirs, uh, but to find, find out more about uh, this treasure, uh, she had to travel to the Netherlands to read the whole run of the newspaper. The whole run of the newspaper sent her back to Laredo to a family member. And we found out that the, the collection the, with the photographs, the letters from the, with the Mexican, uh, the, the most important generals of the revolution, were at her um, granddaughter's house here in Houston. So it was so close, but it took the trip and the knowledge of uh, the scholarly work of this uh, colleague and, and, and to be able to find this material that as, as of now is the only memoir written by a woman that we know of about the Mexican Revolution. Something that is really uh, important to mention is that we create the databases around our work, these archives, the newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. And we work with the Redex and uh, EBSCO to make available these materials uh, to scholars uh, all over the country. So you can find uh, around 440 of our newspapers through Redex. Uh, through Arte Publico Hispanic Collections and EBSCO, you can find thousands of our, the books that we have recovered uh, collections and uh, uh, articles uh, index in English and Spanish. So if you're thinking about creating a project, this is something that we I, I would re really like to stress is the, the copyright resources. Uh, so if you think about working or publishing something, just be very aware of, uh, of copyright issues and, and the issues that you can uh, encounter and working on materials that are post-1923, for example. So we wanted to share some information here. I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, you probably will have access to these uh, slides later. So go over the information and when you create or work on a project, uh, think and, re and remember about this uh, that can create a, a big issue for you and for your research later on. I also added some uh, copyright resources that you can consult later. Uh, and and uh, to, to go back to this in the future. Digital humanities for us, it's not something that is emerging. Um, we, in fact, um, a lot of the work that the recovery has been doing for the past um, 26, 27 years um, has been at the forefront of technology. We have, from the very beginning, we have uh, been uh, digitizing uh, documenting the Latino presence in a, uh, using the, 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 the most important and uh, technological advances that we had at our hands at that moment. And so, <clears throat> so when digital humanities started, you know, making its, its, uh, um, started making waves in, in the, in, in the, the in the humanities world, um, uh, by then, um, we have been doing quite a bit of work. We didn't necessarily call ourselves digital humanists, but we call ourselves uh, scholars, historians, uh, librarians, who were doing something other on the site because we had to figure out a way to document the, the history that was uh, the, his the Latino history that was not being uh, recovered or incorporated into um, traditional archives or museums, or even if it was there, it was placed in, in, uh, in spaces where uh, it was not taken care of. It wasn't uh, necessarily um, assigned to an archivist or, 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 and if whenever it was assigned to an archivist, unfortunately those archivists, many of the archivists at that time, except for, for, um, for uh, Maria Cotera, uh, for example, um, for, well, for Marta Cotera, I'm sorry, uh, they, many were not uh, trained and, and knowledgeable about how to work with the archives of the, of the Latino community. And so uh, I wanna make sure that, that we understand that, that this, is, this is work that has been ongoing. Now what we have now is a space, a center that is uh, extending the work of the recovery program. And um, I, wanna, I wanna start by saying that we part from a position of social justice 
And so for us, we establish a praxis that whenever you work with, with uh, US Latino materials, we think about, we have to think about the work of, uh, of, of scholars such as Emma Perez, who invites us to think about how uh, we, have this, we have to be writing, um, we have to think about ways of, about how to rewrite our history and, and, uh, and how we are really uh, endowed with the agency to rewrite our history, to rethink ourselves within this, these spaces that have left uh, Latinos out of, uh, out, of, out of them. So all the discourses, literary discourse, the, the historical discourse, and she invites us to, to write from that perspective. And so I, I give this quote here from her, from her, um, from book, her book, The Decolonial Imaginary. And, uh, and I also uh, invite you to visit our website at Arte Publico Press because we have an ongoing uh, um, Sotero uh, bibliography that lists a lot of the, the writers and theorists and uh, scholars who, who, uh, who's, on whose shoulders we stand as we think and process these materials from, a, from, a, from an um, academic perspective and also from a community perspective. Because one of the things that we do at the Recovery in the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program in the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities space is that we think of digital humanities not as a as an as an as a as a as a process that is that is that is complete with the community with the subject matter that we're working with. We think of those of those subjects of those materials as exactly as subjects. We think of them as, uh, as, as elements that are producing knowledge. So if you read the work by Maria Cotera, for example, in her Chicana Praxis, she also invites us to think of them in that way and not necessarily as items that are just giving you the knowledge and you're taking the data and producing something with it and then, and then you just forget them and put them back in the archive. That's not where we part from. Um, I'll go back one, one quick slide just so that um, so that I can also um, tell you what what we understand uh, digital humanities to mean. Uh, if you visit uh, Amanda Visconti's uh, blog on, on on what is and what are digital humanities, she gives us a lot of a lot of important information about this field that is very contested about, about what it means and what it what in, and how different people understand it. And so for us, it's it's a very practical way of looking at the, at, the, at the way technology is. And so we take technology and we apply it to the digital, to the, to the research question. And we start to question that those, when these two things come together, uh, it allows us to question the, the spaces in which the Latino community, the brown people are not present. And then we also start to question why, right? And that allows us to reveal certain uh, structural uh, paradigms that are there that really demonstrate uh, the erasure or the constant uh, struggle, right, to erase erase our history out of these uh, discourses. And so, uh, for me, this 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 specific slide that she has in in her in her um, in her publication is very useful because it really puts things into a very um, um, visual and, and, and practical perspective. I'll uh, let, give you a little bit of information about the, the space that we created. For us, it, it was important to um, secure funding. Thankfully, we, able, we were able to obtain a, a large grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and we're very grateful to them for that. Uh, that that uh, grant uh, started out as a planning grant that allowed us to travel through the nation to visit different centers to see um, what you know what the different work that was being carried out and to see what types of uh, scholarship and what types of activities were, ta uh, were, were taking place in those centers so that we could in turn uh, model our own center after that and so we eventually were able to apply for a larger grant that, that now has given us funding for three years to really uh, fortify the establishment as, of a space that will extend the work that the recovery project has been doing to and so this space is now supporting development, support and training uh, of digital humanities projects with a focus on recovered materials that live at the University of Houston, but also that live at other institutions. Uh, we want to make sure that um, that people use the model that we produced at the recovery project, uh, that the recovery program, and that they take that into their own institutions. That they um, 
investigate their their own uh, archives and their, the spaces within their their own um, communities to find where those Latino materials are or where the or, or materials that, that belong to uh, underserved communities where they are where they are why you know why they're not incorporated into into traditional uh, um, archives etc and to start interrogating that and perhaps maybe that's the, that's the beginning of documenting that presence and then beginning the the early stages of a digital humanities project which is uh, doing the the data collecting and uh, the maybe digitization uh, and that way you uh, start accumulating right amassing some of the some of the data that you can eventually help into creating a, a a, a project that will shed light on, on, on those materials. Um, we also uh, want to create a, a space for a digital publication. We have, we just recently launched uh, APP Digital, and this is done through uh, Manifold. Uh, we also received a, a grant from Manifold for training and to, um, and to secure a virtual space that would hold our digital, our first digital publications. So we invite you to visit our website and to access that so that you can see what those publications look like. These are also publications that, that are, um, that fulfill the, 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 the requirements that we usually have for Arte Publico Press publications. Arte Publico Press is the umbrella organization that, that sees, uh, that hosts uh, recovering the, the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program and USLDH. And Arte Publico is the oldest and the premier Latino uh, publisher of Latino, of US Latino writers in the US. So for example, um, they, they were the, we were the first to, to publish um, Sandra Cisneros, The House on Mango Street, uh, Ana Castillo, for example. And so we follow the same standards in our APP uh, publications uh, uh, through APP Digital. Uh, and lastly, I should also indicate that these digital publications are, uh, open source, uh, they're, they're, um, they're, 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 they'll be shared with, uh, freely with everyone. They have the capability for annotation. And so we invite you to, to, to visit them and to look, look to see if, if you can you know, use them in your classes. They're, um, biling they're, they will be done bilingually. Um, then uh, another element, another key element for this USLDH uh, space and the practices that, that, that we want to think about as you work with if, as you start thinking about working with U.S. Latino uh, materials, is also to promote and foster interdisciplinary work. Um, in, important for it's important for us so that we document the presence of other scholars doing this type of work, and also to demonstrate that this is this activity. For a long time, we were told that uh, we're working in silos, or that we're working independently, or there's no interest in U.S. Latino. Uh, materials, but the reality is that there are many uh, scholars who are who are doing this work, and maybe it's not necessarily the work that they're doing for their uh, tenure track portfolio. Uh, but once we start seeing that many more people are doing this type of work, then it'll be difficult for for uh, at the institutions right to question whether or not this work is viable and and important. Uh, one of the an, a key element for this and that, that is that is important right now to mention is that we are we we through the through the Mellon Foundation grant we are awarding um, grants in aid in the amount of seventy five hundred dollars uh, to produce a a, 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 a digital uh, project and a publication and so we have a we've awarded the first seven. Uh, for last summer, and so we just uh, published the call for the, few, the, the next grants in aid projects, and we'll be sharing that with you at the end, or, or you can access that at the, through, our, through our website. Um, and then we also want to create this uh, communal virtual space uh, where, object, where these uh, projects are shared and the, this knowledge is, is shared on Latino and Latino digital humanities. Uh, all of these elements are, are, are present in our, in our Arte Publico Press uh, um, webpage and under Digital Humanities. Um, and the last one is to establish a Latina or Latino DH hub. And for that to, that to us, it's again to become following on the tracks of what the recovery has been doing to document the presence of Latinos and the scholarship and the different publications that have that have uh, existed here in the US 
that really uh, allow us to document the presence and, and, and make our community visible. We feel that also we need to have uh, document the footprint in Latino, Latino DH that our community has been making. So we, uh, in, on, our, on our website, you will also see a document that lists uh, the various uh, digital humanities projects that exist to date on, on uh, Latinos that we know of and that people have, have, shared, have shared with us. So as we work on, on our digital humanities uh, projects and as you, as you begin to work on, on some of these projects, and of course, when you think about this, um, th this, this praxis does not only lend itself to think about the Latino community, but also on any underserved community. Um, always ask yourself, how do you approach, right? How, how are we approaching this US Latino experience? And this is very important to us because it allows us to, to understand uh, our privilege and, the, and perhaps the different views that we will be applying or the different uh, maybe prejudices that we will be looking at, you know, with, with, that will govern the way we will be looking at some of these materials. And, and also, it, it, in, 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 and if you will have, and, and if by this time you have read, um, you will have read um, Chicana, um, Chicana Praxis by Maria Cotera, you'll re be reminded of, of thinking about the, 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 about how the, the data that you're using will, will have to be able to participate with you uh, as, as part of the, of the research team, right? So that that data does not simply be, become an element of your research or, or, a, or a, you know, a, a, an object within your, your, your study, but rather it is an element that is producing knowledge along with you, as you, you may be writing about it, but that, 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 that subject that you're working with uh, is creating this knowledge for you as well. And so we see ourselves as, as, uh, as, as tools, right, that are allowing, that are using our voice, right, to extend, to, to give voice and to give, um, uh, to allow these, these uh, archives to speak for themselves. Um, how do we understand the importance of ethnic materials in the U.S.? So also thinking about the, the, the importance of these materials within the, of, of, uh, within the United States and the role that the United, the, the United States has assigned to them. And so a lot of times we, we think of these materials simply as, uh, as, as materials that will you know, diversify you know, a collection. Well, if that's, if that's the, we have to ask ourselves these specific questions so that we understand uh, whether or not we are honoring uh, these, the, 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 the way, you know, the, the communities that these materials represent. Um, uh, important question on language. Uh, for us, it's extremely important to use uh, languages, uh, it's Spanish especially, but if there's, language, if there's other languages other than English, um, we also have to figure out a way to contend with that because a lot of the materials that Latinos produced in the U.S were produced in Spanish. Uh, there's, there's a lot of materials that were produced in English, as, of course. Uh, but the, you know, unfortunately, because a lot of those, the newspapers that were published in Spanish um, were written in Spanish, they were, they were not in, uh, incorporated into archives. And so, many, and so that's the reason why many of them have been lost. So there's, there's a way also to interrogate how language has been used to erase our history. Um, uh, Carolina talked a little bit about copyright issues. Uh, so how do we create meaningful and respectful data? So we need to really think about what the data is, what the data is, is, is telling us and try to understand it within the, the, the time when that data was created, how it was archived, how perhaps that, that archive is organized. And, and, and although we cannot go back in time, we can certainly go back and understand the history uh, the events that were taking place, and perhaps if you know, if, if you look at the at the at some of the examples that Carolina gave you of some of the newspapers, why don't we have a complete run of certain newspapers, and why are some of them missing? Well, it's it's understanding that some of the some of that data was not uh, was not cared for correctly, and also uh, and also because because of the way that that it was preserved by by the community that that eventually uh, uh, was able to share it with us um, 
how do we go work with community owners of the knowledge? Um, this is extremely important for us because as reco in, in, the, in recovery, we have always um, practiced um, custo uh, post-custodial practices. And what, we, what that means for us is that if a community member wants to share an archive with us, uh, if a lot of times they will approach us and, and they'll ask us about, you know, giving us their archive or, or, or seeing if, if we're interested, if, if, if their archive is, is important. Um, a lot of times they, they, they don't, they understand that their archive is, is valuable, but they don't understand why or how they just understand that it's, that, that it's valuable. And because, um, a lot of times the, you know, uh, in traditional archives, a lot of times Latinos have not been present. Um, the Latino community doesn't see themselves represented in them, and so they they think that maybe their archive is not as is not should not be part of a of a traditional archive. And or they they know that if they if they give their archive to a library, for example, where there may be like a number there are a number of Latinos or 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 no Latinos. That their archive might be lost and they a lot of people really want their archive to be shared with with other community um, they want to uh, have visualizations they want to have somebody do do research on their projects on their on their on their archives and so we 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 offer them the the opportunity to we always uh, you know help them evaluate their archive help them understand that their archive is important and also um, we provide various alternatives for them. So we can, you know, we, we will always digitize the archive if they're okay with that. And we give them a copy of the digital archive. And if they want the original archive back, we give it back to them. Uh, because for us, it's a matter of preserving that archive. It's not a matter of us owning that archive. Uh, now, if they do want to, uh, they do want us to take ownership of the archive, we, we put it in, the, in special collections at the University of Houston. Uh, because we do, uh, we do believe that these archives need to be part of a, an institution that should be responsible to uh, to the community for pres for preservation and for uh, making this the, these uh, archives available to other people in, in in the community as well, and not just uh, through through our through us. Um, and so, once the community, once the archive comes to us, we immediately start thinking about. Uh, um, different projects that can be done with the archive. So uh, as, a, as a press, a lot of times we first think about the publication of a book, if that's available. And then in terms of digital humanities, we start thinking about other ways in which, uh, in which we can visualize the archives. And that is why later on, uh, my colleagues will talk about uh, the, the three um, strategies or two of the, of the main strategies that we have used to visualize one, which is Omeka, uh, and the other one is uh, it's, it's timeline. Um, and then how do we create knowledge and, and scholarship based on these materials? We have approximately um, uh, 40 to 50 uh, board members uh, in, 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 in that are, uh, who are members of the recovery board. And, and these scholars uh, cover the different fields uh, from library, library, library studies to history, sociology, Spanish, uh, uh, language, etc., and and these scholars are often creating knowledge. We also train uh, graduate and undergraduate students. Um, we have approximately uh, twenty dissertations that have come out of the work that our students have done, and also through the grants and aid program that that, that we have uh, had over the years. Um, when the recovery first started through a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, we were able to award. Um, about 150 grants and and lastly um, we are one of our the, the uh, one of our most important um, aspects of the work that we do is is that we work fully we, we work full circle with the community so it's for for us the research and the the scholarship that we practice that we practice is not a scholarship that is that, that is uh, top down from the uh, from academia to the community, it's reverse. We work with the community. We under, we we try to make sure um, that the that the materials that the the scholarship that we are producing is a scholarship that can be ingested by the community. That is why the 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 data the uh, the platforms that we use, the software that we use, 
are platforms that the community can then take ownership and reproduce their own versions of, of, this, of, the, of, the, of the materials that we're, that we're doing. So uh, we also teach our community how to use uh, some of these, um, how, how to use some of these um, uh, software so that they can, so that they can use it so for their own purposes. So for us, the community is an essential part of the work that we do. And, um, and so these are, these, these, these questions will help you guide um, the work that you're, you're doing, specifically if you're thinking about working with the, with the USLDH materials. And I'll pass that on now to my colleague, uh, Minda. So thank you, Gabby. Um, so Gabby's been giving you a wonderful insight into the work that we do at USLDH, the work that we've been doing at Recovery with Catalina's opening. So I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly about public humanities and, and how we, we, we think about public humanities and, and then what makes Latinx digital humanities different, or at least unique, maybe not different. Uh, so the way we're defining this understanding of public humanities is that um, projects presented to the public that are produced institutionally, often broad in scope, um, and collections that articulate articulated in some way to reflect a subject significant to a discipline, um, which of course recognizes um, the value of the material produced by the subject, which then offers up a value-added scenario for future research. Um, uh, let's see, the second thing would be uh, collections that represent an event, an issue, or circumstance, also well documented from traditional sources, like uh, second wave feminism, uh, like Laurie Steinem's collection at Smith. Um, the second thing is accessibility, um, curated collections of archival materials. Um, so subject materials are collected to reside in a place, right, accessible with permissions to certain communities. For example, I, as a student of a university, have, a special access, has, have access to special collections within my library system. If my university belongs to a consortium, Big Ten, Big 12, ACC, SEC, PAC-10, or PAC, I will also have access to those libraries. But if I'm a legacy scholar, a community activist or someone with no ties to the institution, do I have the same access to these collections? With public funded collections like the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, local public library holdings, I have more access as a, as a card carrying, you know, library uh, participant member of, of public library, you know, concern. For example, a number of museums in Chicago have special collections, some of which are available to non-institutional scholars. But how aware are we of this access? If you are a community member or a legacy scholar or someone just interested in a period of time or, or a subject famous to Chicago, like Ida B. Wells. Uh, the Newberry Library, the DuSable Museum, the National Museum of Mexican Art, and the Chicago History Museum have very different protocols about access and use. Do we know them? Not really. And that is one of the ways that we, you know, understand access to public collections or collections within institutions. There isn't access. We don't have an, an immediate accessibility outside of the academy. So, and uh, uh, Gabby alluded to this uh, a minute ago in the way we approach uh, the work here at USLDH, but the whole idea of top-down knowledge um, collections within institutions come to the archive embedded in a political structure reliant on a value and value added model. Familiar subjects, faculty, popular figures get precedent. The more people know these people, the more value they have. The traditional model assigns value to a collection based on its existing relationship to the archive or the discipline. The more scholarship that has been done about a person makes them more relevant within the academy, within the discipline. So there is more of an interest or there is more value applied to that subject, that collection, those materials. There, so, so what happens is you have this sort of feedback loop that happens that Maria Cotera talks about. Um, I know Maria's kind of a, a foremother to our work, but the Cotera family in general. Um, so that you have this loop of materials being produced around a subject or a topic um, that continue to create the value of that subject or topic. If there is any other material or subject relevant to that topic, are they as addressed? 
probably not. Uh, which, which leads me to the finite nature of collections. So in the traditional model, collections are received, ingested, cataloged uh, by a Library of Congress subject with Dublin core descriptives and offered via some iteration of a finding aid. So I visit an institution with a collection on a subject. I view materials that exist individually on their, off, on their own, often with no mention of reference to other materials. So, you know, subject, objects that in a vacuum. The assumption is that there's a traditional scholarship on this subject that will ground me enough to translate what I'm looking at to offer answer to the questions I've arrived at to, to explore in this, in this collection and will create those connections. So in other words, there's enough scholarship that has already been produced about this subject because it is interesting and it is valuable and it is, it is available that I won't need a translation of any sort in the form of an annotation or in the form of some sort of curated experience to answer the questions that I am coming to this collection with. So this allows materials within a collection to live within a vacuum. There's enough information about the subject, external information about the subject and their relationship to a field, both personal and professional, to inform a collection. In other words, I don't need to come, I don't need any more information about those artifacts or that material within that collection because there's enough that's been written about it. So what about collections that haven't been written about? Well, they're not in the archive because, so you see how that's sort of a loop? So the other issue with public humanities projects is that they are sometimes community engaged but not often community controlled. Is there space in the collection for materials that don't fall into this value added category of the recognized name or scholarship? If collections are accepted that are, are not or cannot be grounded in the literature of a discipline, how then are those materials described? When materials are accepted from a community, the dialogue with the community is often unidirectional. In other words, collections are adjusted, defined, and stored, reflecting the colonial protocols and limited knowledge of the academy about the collection. The community is proactive and the resources that are available to include some understanding of the post-custodial materials. There will be a richer definition of metadata, but not necessarily of subject identification. And I bring up subject identification at this point because one of the things that Lorena is going to talk about is how we do adapt that. Again, there is the last issue of money. So institutions have support for, or some support, for, um, uh, for collections. Well, often there's private donations. Uh, so, you know, there is a, there's a whole conversation around this, around the collecting process that is directly related to money. Um, a library gets a collection, a significant one, or even a, a significant one to a community that understands its significance. The Academy, is already approaching its financial situations about, about increase as decrease. So calls for diversity clash head on with calls for austerity. So collections have to be ingested, identified and categorized, categorized, but not necessarily digitized. That isn't, nece that isn't often an option that doesn't require an additional grant being written. Another task on the overlong due list for archives or librarians who are less inclined if the value of a collection is not immediately recognized. So these are kind of the, the challenges we have um, when thinking about public humanities and when thinking about public humanities projects. So the difference with Latinx DH from this whole concept of a top-down model of, 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 a, of traditional in, ingestion of, of of, of collections is that our projects begin with relationships and networks that again Gabby and, and Carolina have done a really wonderful job of describing here. Um, but we do begin with community, understanding the value of the contribution that occurs with the subject and the object and the experience of both together, connected, reflected within students who are experiencing the, the, the process of, of digitizing materials with interviewing subjects if they're still alive. Um, building community means building a network of participants that includes both subjects and practitioners in a multidisciplinary approach to the accumulation of knowledge. Collecting the object and data and building the resource. Uh, 
Networks don't just apply to the community being collected. Networks include the technological needs of collections, archivists, writers, media specialists, and technologists helping to create and support the community collection. Culturally representational per persons add a language and focus to the building of a sustainable model of collection. Because remember, it isn't just about collecting, it is also about maintaining those collections. We center community-based knowledges and experiences. All knowledge is equal. All knowledge has value. All contributions are both sound and important to the collaborative production of a collection. Often our projects are led by scholars with an understanding that each practitioner and subject will have productive insights into the vision of the project. All voices matter, especially in projects that highlight contributions that have been neglected or silenced. There's also a collaborative ethic of giving back. The relationship of the subject and the practitioners to the collection is bi-directional, allowing the contributor to share the history and purpose of an object, the specifics of a life story, and the practitioner to articulate that knowledge, not just in terms of media or cultural production, but in terms of infrastructure, how we actually access that information, how we're integrated into the process. The relationship of the subject and the practitioners to the collection is bi-directional, and that's very, very important. It is a conversation. And in that conversation, there is this transgenerational knowledge exchange that occurs with storytelling. But it's who's telling the story, who's witnessing the story, who's articulating the story. Students, scholars, practitioners, subjects, the material, all come together in this knowledge exchange as a witness of students who are trying to then articulate this witness within their own, from their own trans-historical and transcultural lenses. So it's this whole multicultural, multilingual scene of exchange and production that transforms and doesn't duplicate the digital record. Students and researchers are given the opportunity to cultivate new knowledge. And in this way, the archive is not a static space of storage, but a dynamic one of, as Mariko Tata describes, encuentro or encounter, with the observations of each generation commenting on their specific contributions of labor can be seen often as annotations to material or creations of curations of work where their themes are discovered that may not have been present in the archive alone. The archive then becomes, again, this living place of discourse between the practitioners, the subject, and the public. Non-traditional methods of articulation that engage the community, thereby creating a sense of permanence and belonging. Storytelling is one thing, but what does it mean to tell the stories of a community of people and places that immerses the audience in the content, situating them in the time, space, and place with meaning? Which leads me to access and precarity. Again, as Garo and Gabby have, have mentioned, these were, were in, there are moments we are in, we are in, that we are in a race against time. Materials have not been have not been preserved in any kind of a way, and we're in a rush to to have this post custodial sort of triage moment to collect as much as we can about a history that we are very very involved in. So building community, so access and precarity, access accountability and precarity, then becomes our responsibility because we are living in these spaces of, 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 of loss, of loss of materials, of loss of, of stories, of loss of history. So building community means understanding the importance of an ongoing, often permanent relationship with a community to the archive. The most important element of this is access to the materials, the articulation both public and private of the work. The active participation and outreach and education of that same community to the archive's relevance to it. Here, the scholar in the institution can provide the active role, helping find a home for the materials, a long-term home for the actual materials, helping to interrogate the post-custodial materials within the classroom space. Uh, and again, this goes back to the whole idea of accountability. The donations that we are given in terms of these collections, we all understand that they are gifts. It, they're not just artifacts or data. It's the transformation, they, they, are, they are gifts that create these transformational moments of witness that each practitioner experiences with their own interaction with this data. The collection for all participants to its cultivation becomes our group responsibility to produce. It creates in each one of us a sense of cultural obligation to record, 
document, curate, and ultimately give new and unique voice to material from moments that resonate in their universality. And so I'm going to turn this over now to Lorena to talk a little bit about the samples um, of work that we are doing and how this is actually happening uh, at USLDH. All right, so I'm going to give a few examples that we feel really exemplify um, the use of two specific platforms, Omeka and Timeline. But I do invite you to um, visit our webpage at thepublicopress.com and navigate to Recovery Program, where you can see our menu that includes digital humanities and a listing of our digital humanities projects. So you can see a few more uh, projects that use the archive in different ways and visualize the information using different platforms. And so this, this one is from our Omeka collection. You can actually find it at uslhrecovery.uh.edu. And this is a collection and an exhibit that uses the, the, the Leonor Villegas de Magnum collection, which Carolina mentioned at the beginning. One of the important things about these these projects is that they start with the archive and then we find it important to contextualize rather than just put the images out there without having the historical or linguistic context. And this, this one specifically was created by our HCC colleague, Melinda Mejia, that's the Houston um, Community College. And so we have scholars, we have staff, at recovery. We also have students at different levels of their academic career that help so that they not only get to work with the archive itself, but they also learn how to create metadata, how to describe these archives, how to do, do the research around it, and how to best describe it, describe them in ways that make sense and connect to the community and just what um, connecting to what Linda said uh, they the, the whole point is to um, tell stories in a way that uh, is respectful of the archive and that is also telling an accurate and representative story from the perspective of the archive right not trying to appropriate appropriate one of the things that is really important for our, our archive is that it is multilingual. And so we want to make sure that we represent the Spanish language in a way that increases searchability. And rather than limit ourselves by the Library of Congress subject headings, we also create Spanish language um, sorry, Spanish language tags or keywords that help people find the, the documents that they're looking for. It gives different or multiple ways of entry to find the documents. This is um, the Omeka collection is available and accessible by the wider public, so not just um, academics. We try to describe these documents in both the metadata and in the um, exhibits in a way that is accessible to people not just within academia but k through 12 through the community because one of the things we find is really important is that we want our community to find the cultural representation that is reflective of their history when they google themselves when they get online and do a search for for example latina we don't want them to find stereotypical, over-sexualized hits on, uh, on the internet. Instead, what we're doing is to trying to populate the web space and use that web space as a space of resistance where we can really push back on the canonical or kind of curriculum of US history and to show a more varied, um, truthful history that reflects our community involvement. So this is another example. This is also on the Omeka page. Um, this is an exhibit on the artist and social activist and poet Angela de Hoyos. It was created by a graduate student named Valentina Jaeger and she worked with Gabi on this 
and uh, also had a lot of freedom to do research and to really focus on what she felt was important to highlight. And so she decided to write this bilingually so that there is a Spanish version and then an English version. And she was really thinking about who the audience of this exhibit would be. Now this is actually another exhibit on the same historical person, Anangela de Hoyos. This is also a student exhibit. This one is actually created by an undergraduate at Rice who came to recovery at UH um, to fulfill a cultural heritage class credit. And um, she wanted to focus on the art aspect of Angela's collection. And so you see that there's various ways to enter into this collection, to explore it, uh, to tell different stories about the same collection. And then we also use timelines. So we partnered with LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, which is the oldest and longest lasting Latino organization in the United States that was created to uh, to ensure the civil rights of Latinos. And uh, what we thought was really important was to focus or, or to highlight the chronology, this long important history of social activism um, that LULAC has carried out since 1929. And a, an undergraduate actually did this research and created this interactive timeline. So not only did she gain a training in the digital tools, but she also learned how to do um, archival research and how to be, be part of this collaborative team that was in the, in the university, but also connected to LULAC in the community. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Carolina. Thank you, Lorena. So uh, just to, to comment on this uh, community uh, engagement and uh, work with LULAC, uh, we, uh, a few years ago, we received a, a, a collection from uh, the family members of Alonso Perales. Alonso S. Perales uh, was a, a, a civil rights leader, uh, an attorney, and um, who was fighting for the civil rights of uh, Mexican Americans and Latinos and Latinas in the United States. And so, with the just to thank you everyone for um, for your uh, contributions, Lorena, Carolina, and and Linda for um, for your participation in this uh, in this presentation on uh, on U.S. Latinx uh, praxis and, and and archival praxis. Um, I hope that we were able to give you a really good understanding of how to think about what to think about as you embark in a digital humanities uh, project that deals with the with the U.S. Latino community and archives, and understand that these uh, the, uh, these practices that we're discussing uh, are transferable to other uh, communities as well. And I think one of the most important things for us is under, uh, coming from this, um, um, the perspective of respect uh, and to understanding that the work that we're doing is really standing on the shoulders of, of not only of academic work that, that, is, that, is, you know, that has been done by other scholars, but also by other scholars of, of, of color who have not had the opportunity to uh, who, or whose work has not been cited because they have been working on work with uh, um, 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 underrepresented communities or you know black brown communities or Latino communities and so I think it's important um, to to understand that as well um, I, 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 I included this slide at the very end just to remind you about who we are as a USLDH uh, space that we created um, I invite you to look at our website, artepublicopress.com, to get more information about the grants in aid that we announced. There's, uh, um, the, the announcement has recently been made for the next cycle of, of grantees uh, that should be, that would be um, available uh, soon. And uh, lastly, um, we invite you to use the hashtag USLDH.com if you come around any, um, 
digital humanities project that is that that brings together U.S. Latino and uh, digital humanities because we would like to document the the presence of that of that uh, project or that initiative in the data set in the database that we've created and that lives on artepublicopress.com under uh, digital humanities uh, under the digital humanities uh, um, section. Um, this is a way in which we continue to document the, 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 the presence of Latinos in the US. Um, we thank you and we look forward to talking and, and having uh, questions from you uh, in, a, in a week from now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.